Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Understanding and Applying Agile Marketing in the Real World. My name is Tom Trainer, Global Head of Marketing at Arm Treasure Data, and today I'd like to introduce you to our speaker, Andrea Freirier. So Andrea is the co-founder of Agile Sherbas and is the world's leading authority on Agile Marketing. She is co-author of the IC Agile Certified Professional in Agile Marketing Curriculum, author of two books on marketing agility, and an internationally sought-after speaker in training. When not teaching Agile Marketing, she can be found in the mountains of her adopted home in Boulder, Colorado. For some quick housekeeping, an on-demand version of this webinar will be available immediately after the presentation, and feel free to click and download the attachments below your screen. Lastly, we'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions during or after today's session, please submit them below and we'll do our best to answer them. So without further ado, I'm really excited to have her speak. Here's Andrea. Thank you so much, Tom. Thanks everybody for joining today. I am super excited. This is like some of my favorite types of talks to give is where we, we really talk about what Agile means from a really specific and tactical application standpoint. So without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into some of our content for the day. So I want to spend the bulk of our time going through these tactical application ideas for you. But before we can get there, I need to make sure that we've got a good solid understanding of what's actually meant by the phrase Agile Marketing. Uh, because as this fun little cartoon from Tom Fishburne that is showing up, I think. My slides are not responding. Tom, are you seeing them? Yeah, I clicked. Uh, yeah, the next slide I show is the um, is the subway map. Hmm. Well, all of my slides have disappeared on my presenter <laughs> view. That's all right. <laughs> there it is, and we're back. Okay, technology for the win. No problem. Don't okay. worry about it. Just to get get settled and. Uh... Yep, I got it. I see the the uh, subway map. You see the same? Yep. Good deal. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the visualization of marketing as if it were a subway map. And the reason that we need agility is because of this increased complexity in the world of marketing. So. The way that we do marketing, right, the number of channels and the ways that we communicate and interface with our audience has exploded in complexity in the recent past. So the marketing profession, the way we do it, the things we do, has really altered itself over the last decade especially. But the problem is that we have not done a very good job as marketing professionals of keeping up with that rate of change through our work management approaches. So we're very much more like our friend Don Draper here than we would like to admit in terms of how we manage our work, right? But he had it much easier than we do. All he had to worry about was print, television, radio, maybe a few billboards here and there, and he's good to go. Uh, but we have, as that map showed us, a lot more going on that we have to consider. And so we've struggled to keep up with this rate of change because our approach to work management is still pretty old school. So here's the, uh, the cartoon that I was mentioning from Tom Fishburne where he's talking about this very common misunderstanding of what agile marketing actually means, right? When we don't have a strategy, we change our minds a lot, and we fail over and over again, let's just blame it on being agile, and we're off the hook. Um, that is not the kind of agility that we need in order to deal with the complexities of modern marketing. It's just not going to cut it. Uh, we definitely need something more substantial, more robust, more rigorous to handle the realities of our day-to-day -day work. And that's what Agile actually means, the, the capital A version, not the lowercase a version. So lowercase a is just a regular old adjective where we're fast and we are oftentimes responsive 
to incoming data, to new situations, but we're just that way by necessity because we have no other choice to navigate things. We are fast, but typically it's just moving fast kind of in a straight line like maybe a cheetah. What we need to be is capital A, Agile. That's not going to happen by accident. It requires us to take very deliberate steps to change the way that we work. And this is what's going to allow us to bob and weave like the gazelle does and get around obstacles and go actually much faster in the uncertain environment right, that we're trying to navigate than if we were just totally fixated on speed. And it's this capital A Agile that we're going to be moving toward through the practices that we talk about today. That's, that's really where we want to get. It's not just about speed, but it's about adaptability. It's about choosing the right framework, the right practices and processes to support ourselves. And it's not ever going to happen by accident. It's going to require us to take some hard steps to really make it happen. For marketing in particular, there are some very um, challenging wrinkles that we have to work through in order to get agility to work for us. Right? As I'm sure you know, Agile originated in the world of software development, and we are not developers in marketing. Uh, we do different types of work. The types of people that tend to gravitate toward marketing are oftentimes different than developers. And so we've got a lot of different considerations to, to process when we're figuring out how to be capital A Agile. These are some of the ones that tend to get in our way most often. The first is that we've got different types of work that are going to be processed by the same team. So we've got these recurring activities of keep the lights on type work, right? Content has to be published. Social media has to be distributed. Emails have to go out. These are things that just always have to happen. And then those same people are also responsible for these strategic, long-term, big campaigns and initiatives. And they have to balance them in the same system. And that can be challenging. Marketing is also plagued by people being on too many quote-unquote teams. Uh, I'm a content marketer and an English major, so my use of quotation marks here is very deliberate. Um, we get fixated on these project teams, which are not teams in the way that we would talk about them in the Agile world. We want to be able to put people on one team and one team only so they can develop rapport, become high-performing, focus their time and energy effectively. Um, this is very, very important for a lot of these practices that I'm going to show you to work at their best. But what we quickly discover when we try to do this is we're oftentimes not resourced well to build these kinds of persistent cross-functional teams, right? Our, our marketing department of 20 decides that we want to build four cross-functional teams of five, but oh no, we only have one writer, one content creator. And so where do they go, right? Now we're back to the sitting on too many teams problem. Uh, so this is something that marketing has to grapple with. We are very service-oriented, so lots of people need stuff from us a lot of the time. And this makes it hard for us to plan a sprint in the way that the development team would because we're going to be getting requests from sales, uh, press release needs to go out, there's a situation that needs to be responded to right through, through branding and corporate communications. So there's lots of stuff that makes it difficult for us to effectively plan a sprint. Many of us are marketing unicorns that were hired for a special power, right? Uh, for me, it would be I was hired as a content marketer or a content strategist. I'm not here to do the email, right? And so it can be difficult for us to become more focused on the team's success and less focused on our individual KPIs. But this is something that's going to be quite important as we look to build proper Agile teams uh, that are able to support one another in their execution of amazing work. And then lastly, most marketers have not worked in an Agile system before. Um, we found with our research in the State of Agile Marketing Report this year that for the first time we had more Agile marketers responding than traditional marketers, but only by 1%. So it was 42% Agile and 41% traditional in our survey this year. So more marketers have experience, but definitely not the majority of us yet. And so if we don't take the time to educate ourselves by hopefully coming to 
great webinars like this one, we can make mistakes that would otherwise be avoidable. Right? So taking the time to figure things out, work things through from a best practices perspective instead of just diving in can help us um, not succumb to these otherwise avoidable mistakes. So then we've got these core considerations for marketing agility. I need to address some key myths uh, before we get into practices because these, if we, if we have these misconceptions in our mind, we will misapply the practices that I'm going to show you. Uh, the first myth is that somehow we don't plan in Agile marketing, that it just sort of works itself out. Um, that's, that's definitely not the case. There is a lot of planning in an Agile environment, but it's different types of planning, and it actually happens more often. It just covers a shorter uh, time horizon. Agile does not just equal speed, right? We were talking about this when we were distinguishing between capital and lowercase a Agile. So speed, yes. Productivity, yes. But also customer centricity, also quality, and also sustainable pace. So we should be able to keep moving at our pace that we establish in an Agile system indefinitely. It's not about running ourselves to death in the name of getting things out the door. And lastly, Agile marketing is not always Scrum. It's actually almost never Scrum, as we're going to see from some data in just a second. So the first myth we talked about was the anti-planning myth. What you can see here is that Agile is actually composed of a series of shorter term plans that allow us to release a little bit of work sooner, learn from it, and then iterate on it. So that as the opportunity moves, we move with it and can actually get there to meet it. Instead of making a huge upfront plan, going and executing that plan with our blinders on and not, not considering what's going on around us, and then when the, plan, when the opportunity has moved, we miss it entirely. Right, so this is the, the misconception that we need to avoid. Agile does have plans. We have short-term iterative plans and a bigger long-term uh, annual type plan that we are working against. We just make these micro adjustments as we go along. The next myth, of course, is that it's just about speed. Um, this is from the data you're seeing here is from our 2020 State of Agile Marketing Report. And you'll see, yes, Speed is one of the, the top benefits that Agile marketers are reporting, faster time to get things released, and more productive teams. But there's a whole bevy of other great benefits that we get from Agile as well, like doing the right work at the right time through effective prioritization, the ability to respond to incoming data, higher quality of work. I'm so happy that this is in the top five there because it's, it's crucial for marketing to stay focused on quality, and we have to maintain brand standards and not just throw stuff out there uh, willy-nilly. And then you'll also see down there at the 40% mark, improved team morale. So marketers in an Agile system are happier and more engaged, which is quite important in an industry as uh, prone to, or a profession I suppose I should say, as prone to churn as we are inside of marketing. So it's not just about speed. There's lots of other benefits that we want to be seeing when the Agile system is functioning the way that it should. And then lastly, the idea that you've got to use Scrum to be Agile is simply, it's not true anywhere, but it's definitely not true in marketing. So you can see here that the far and away the most common approach that marketers are using to make Agile happen is a hybrid approach. So we're combining practices from multiple frameworks to create something custom for marketing. And this does mean we have to do a little bit more upfront research and look to discover what the bits and pieces are from these other frameworks that will work best for us. So we have to do a little bit of extra homework, but it will serve us well in the end when we can create this customized hybrid. And that's a lot of what I'm going to be showing you when we get to the practices is how to identify and adapt these practices to work best for you in this hybrid sort of way. So don't, don't succumb to the temptation to just try Scrum because it's easier or you have the most information about it. Um, it's definitely not the most common way that marketers are agile. All right, 
So then let's get to the meat of the matter here and figure out some ways to apply Agile. Um, they're easy-ish. Uh, if they were easy, right, everyone would do it, and they would not come with all the amazing benefits. But what I'm going to show you here is sort of the MVP version. Right? I'm not going to tell you that you've got to fundamentally alter much of anything. You can stick with the teams you've got. You can stick with the work that you're doing and start to take these baby steps right, towards agile ways of working um, that are going to be more straightforward, uh, although not without some, some work right, that needs to be done. So the first piece is to understand your work better through the practice of visualization. So we've got to get a handle on everything that's currently in progress and everything that we could be doing in order to make intelligent decisions about what we are and are not going to do in the immediate future. So two ways that we achieve this in the Agile environment, one is through the use of what's called a backlog. Um, this word, backlog, has somehow gotten a bit of a bad rap um, in some contexts. We say, oh, I'm going to put it in the backlog, and it means I'm never going to look at it again. It's going there uh, to die. But in fact, in an Agile system, the backlog is very active, is very up-to-date, and it serves as the team's to-do list. But it's not just a regular to-do list. It's strictly prioritized. So high-value, urgent work is at the very top of the list. And we go then in a prioritized queue downward so that the next most important thing is at number two, three, four, five, and so on, so that less important, less urgent work is down at the bottom. And this prioritization is what allows us to create focused effort, which we'll talk about in a moment. And you can see there's sort of um, bands or tiers within the backlog where we've got some work that's coming up soon. And that's the work that we've taken the time to plan, to uh, speak with stakeholders, to gather requirements, to document more in a more detailed way. But as we work our way down the backlog, these work items are going to be less detailed and less specific because they might never make their way up to the top. As priorities shift and the world changes around us, as it has proven very likely to do in the recent past, some of these things might just get kicked off of the backlog before they make it to the top. And so we don't want to spend a lot of time and energy investigating work that could potentially never get done. So until a work item makes its way near the top of the backlog, we don't spend a lot of time and energy documenting it. But as it moves up, then we need to make sure that it's ready for the team to work on as soon as it hits that top spot. It's also important for marketing in particular to merge everything into the backlog. And this is not going to lie to you, this part is difficult to get right, and it's going to be time consuming in the early stages because you've got to look at all of your recurring work like we talked about, we've got to put out content, we've got to write emails, we've got to do social media, we've got to run events, whatever the, these repeating activities are, they need to be blended in the backlog with your more strategic project work because then and only then can we make good trade-offs about how we're going to spend our time. If the backlog only contains our project work and we ask people to just keep doing their regular kind of day jobs off to the side, it's going to be very challenging for them to choose what to do throughout the day. And they're going to revert to whoever's yelling at me the loudest or whatever is on fire the most, that's the thing I'm going to do, instead of looking at this blended backlog where they can see what's actually the most valuable from the business perspective or from the customer's perspective that's where we start to be able to have the magic happen and we start to do the most important work first instead of the thing that we understand the best or the thing that is yelling at us the loudest. You can see here that the backlog is mostly made up of stories and tasks. So stories is, is referencing user stories. We're not going to go into all of that here today. You can just think of those as kind of a project level. Uh, for scope understanding. And the backlog will typically cover 
something from one to three months worth of work, depending on how well you know what your quarter looks like. Right? If you can predict that, then that can all go into your backlog. But if you can't see that far down the road, then your backlog might only cover a month's worth of work. So we need to balance here what we know and what we understand and what we need to visualize. We also don't want to overwhelm people with a huge amount of, of work within the backlog. So the important thing is for the backlog to be up to date and well prioritized. That's more important than its exact scope or content. Another way to look at this then is the backlog is going to end up covering these sort of lower tiers here where we're down into stories or projects and tasks. These are the sorts of things that go in the backlog. And you're likely to have a larger view that marketing leadership is more concerned with that are covering these bigger kind of annual initiatives. We only have a handful of these in the course of a year that have some maybe some bigger epic projects or epic campaigns attached to them, and then they break down smaller and smaller as they make their way toward the backlog. Once we have a backlog, it's time to start doing the work that it contains. And we use a tool called a Kanban board to help us manage the actual doing of the work. So you can see on the far left hand, we've got a backlog column. That's where all of our upcoming work lives. This particular board has a defined column, and that might be for the necessary project kickoffs or stakeholder interviews or those last few things that need to be done before the work is actually ready to go. And then once we're doing the work, it's in execution mode, then it would enter the in-progress column. When it's actually finished, it would move to done, and then perhaps we need a final sign-off from senior management or something, and then it would move from done to accepted once that had been achieved. So the idea is to see work move from left to right on this board, and we begin to see where work gets stuck, how much we're actually working on at any given moment, and this is a hugely powerful way to get your mind around what is coming at you and what's actually being worked on. The more advanced view of a Kanban board now where we've added these horizontal swim lanes. Here they're writing, design, and video, for instance. These are designed to help you understand where the effort is going within the team. Are we spending all of our time on writing and very little on design? Or here, right, you see only one little sticky note in the video swim lane. And if we have agreed that video is a high priority for us this quarter, this board is showing us that we are not doing a great job, right, of achieving that objective. And this is the power of a visualized workflow is we can start to see where the effort is going and decide if we're spending our time in the right place. The columns and lanes are quite personalized, right? You can break this up in a way that is meaningful for the type of work that you do. And it can be as simple as to do doing done initially to get you kind of comfortable with this type of view. But it's super, super powerful once you get all the work out there where you can see it. The next step once we see everything that's going on is we need to focus. Right? And this is where the really the impacts to productivity and speed that we see as the output of an Agile system, this is where they actually come from. It's not that the people in an Agile team actually move faster. It's that they're doing less and accomplishing more because they work on fewer things through these focusing mechanisms. So there's a couple of ways that we can do this. Uh, the first and probably simplest is by limiting our WIP or work in progress is what that stands for. This is a hard ceiling on the number of activities that a team can be doing at any given moment. You don't want to get it too low because in here you see our hypothetical team of four has set their WIP limit at one, and it's too low because people are bored. Right? There's not enough stuff for them to do, and it takes a long time for work to get from to do, through doing, and to done. So we have a slow flow. 
the too low WIP limit almost never happens. What's typically happening is that our WIP limit is too high. For most marketing teams, they don't have a WIP limit, so it's like it's infinity. And what happens is the doing column fills up, right? It just overflows with work, and no work ever leaves the doing column and makes it over to done. So this is where you are busy all the time, right? There's a lot of activity happening, but none of it is actually being completed, right? So what we want is to move away from this excessive activity and to actually make work done, right? To get it through to the other side of the board. So we need this whip limit that's in this Goldilocks zone of just right. This is where Tasks, once they become active, rarely get stalled out. They're rarely idle. But people can be idle occasionally, and this is quite a good thing because they can help their colleagues, they can learn new skills. There's lots of great ways for them to use this, what we would call slack time, and work will still move fast through the system to done. So this is where the WIP limit is super important and really makes its impact felt. Uh, if you are struggling with how this might work for you, you can start with doing WIP limits for individual people. In that case, I always recommend starting them low, like two per person, because we want to stop starting a whole bunch of stuff and actually start finishing. And the fewer things we're starting, the more likely they are to get done. So a low WIP limit per person is a good starting point. And then you can consider adding them to the columns of your board like you see here. Right? So we have a WIP limit of two on creation, WIP limit of two on review, WIP limit of one on publish. We want to keep these nice and low so that we are pushing work across the board and getting things into done as quickly as possible. The standard rule of thumb for establishing a WIP limit for a column like this is going to be double the number of people that can work that stage. Right? So in this case, we would assume we have only one person who can do creation, so we've doubled that and put it at two. If instead we had two people who could do creation of content, we would set their initial WIP limit at four and then try to ratchet it down from there. All right, we talked about focusing our effort through WIP limits. Uh, before I move on to talking about meetings, I will say that sprints, as, as used in the Scrum framework, are another way to focus your effort on a small amount of work over the course of the sprint. Um, it can be harder for marketing teams, especially initially, to plan sprints effectively because a sprint is going to assume that you mostly know what you're going to be doing between now and the end of the sprint. So a typical sprint length is two weeks. So a plan, a sp meh, sprint planning is going to assume that you can predict most of what you're going to be doing over the course of the next two weeks. If that is not true for you, then a sprint's not going to be a great focusing mechanism because you're going to have a lot of in and out stuff, stuff coming into the sprint and leaving the sprint, and then it's not really doing it primary job. So it is another option here, but the WIP limit tends to be easier to apply for marketers who are just getting started with Agile. All right. Additional practices then. Once we've got our workflow visualized and we're creating focused effort, we need to think about the meetings that allow us to continually improve this system but also allow plenty of time for work to actually get done. It's a big problem, uh, especially in our current distributed work environments. We seem to spend all day on Zoom and not have much time left to actually do work. And so by concentrating some of these standard, concentrating meetings into these standard agile ones, we, we can take things off the calendar. That's really the point here. We're not trying to add more meetings to your calendar. We're trying to replace meetings with these Agile ones. So the first would be planning, or we might refer to this as backlog refinement. The team is going to be here to look through the backlog and decide what they're taking on, how they're going to get things done, who's responsible for what, 
and they're committing to one another to move these cards across the board. This can happen on a weekly basis. That's usually about the right cadence for this, but if you're able to plan a longer time horizon, you could do this once a month, you could do this every other Monday, right? You can play around with the right timing, but you want to make sure that the backlog is prepped and ready in advance of this so the team can review the upcoming work and make good decisions about what they're going to do and when and who's responsible. As the work is happening, it's very, very useful to have a daily stand-up meeting. It does happen daily, but it is very short. So 15 minutes is the standard length for this, and you shouldn't go beyond that. If you're having it less than every day, though, it becomes harder to keep the meeting within that time box, right? So if you're only having it three times a week, you're likely going to push more to like 20 or 25 minutes just because you're going to have more to talk about. The typical format for this is to answer three questions. What did I do yesterday? What I'm going to do today? And what impediments have come up that are preventing me from moving forward? This particular format can get stale for marketing teams if we're all very specialized, right? So I don't really care what the email people are doing. I'm only interested in the content marketing task. So I kind of mentally check out when they're talking. To avoid this problem, we can instead focus on the items on the board, right? What moved forward? What got blocked or unblocked? These are the kinds of conversations we can have instead during stand-up. And the idea here is that it's like a 24-hour strategy session, right? What are we going to do as a unit, as a team, to drive our projects and our tasks forward across the board within the next 24 hours? And thinking about stand-up in this way can help it keep from getting stale and repetitive if you, all you do is, is kind of robotically answer those three questions every day. People can, can start to resent stand-up if it doesn't feel like a useful way for them to spend their time. The other meeting that's quite useful as work is getting done is a review or a demo. And this is where you bring people from outside of the team to show and tell the work that's either completed or being done right now. And so this is, like I said, really important for people outside the team to come. The team doesn't need to show and tell to themselves. They've been talking about this work at Stand Up Every Day for ages. And so it's much better for people outside the team to come. These are your stakeholders. These could be other marketing teams because they might be able to reuse some of the work that was done. And you get feedback in this meeting. It can really eliminate a lot of status -y type meetings that are on your calendar now. And it's really a good time to show what's going on. You can also look backward in these review and demo meetings and say the work we did two weeks ago, right, during our, that we showed you during our last demo, here's how it's performing. Here are the metrics and the KPIs and, and what's going on, and that might end up affecting the work that's in the backlog, right? You might add more items based on a successful project or campaign. You might adjust what you had planned to do based on a not-so-successful project or campaign. And so to, to use the demo to make that uh, adjustment to your short-term plans is another powerful way to make it work as hard as possible. Now, it's best practice to separate these kinds of reviews and demos from another meeting that's called a retrospective. The reviews and demos are about the work. What did we do? How is it performing? Is it meeting the agreed-upon goals and objectives? But the retrospective is different because it's all about the process. How is Agile serving us? Is it going well? Do we need a different digital tool to visualize our work? Is stand up at the wrong time? Is Andrea always late to stand up and we need to deal with that? Right? There's, there's these kinds of process level discussions that need to happen during the retrospective. And this is how we can begin with this MVP approach to agility and then evolve and improve it over time. But the retrospective is, is the only way to make sure that that's happening. Um, again, we can have these every two weeks. Every time we finish a major campaign, we can have a retrospective. But they need to be frequent and recurring 
in order to really have their power tapped into. Uh, we don't want to have these only every six weeks, for instance, because we won't remember all the process level things that, we, that occurred to us as possible improvements if they happened six weeks ago. So all the things that we were just going over, right, visualized work, limited work in progress, agile meetings, these can be done fairly easily inside of a single Agile marketing team. You have a small group of folks, five to nine, right, is kind of the standard Agile team size, adopting these ways of working, and it's pretty easy to do, right? You throw things into a simple digital tool, or when we were all in the office, you could do it with, with whiteboards and sticky notes. It's pretty straightforward. Where things get fun and uh, complicated is when we have multiple teams that need to work together. And so they can all start with some of these simple steps and simple practices, but we also need to have an eye toward what's going to happen when they need to work together. And so sometimes in these larger scaled, big picture kinds of implementations, it's useful to start with a pilot, right? If we have a department of 100 marketers, we don't necessarily want them all to change their, the way they work tomorrow, so we might decide to do a pilot. If I had a dollar for every time I have heard marketing leaders say, well, we'll pilot by putting people into an agile project for, you know, let's do like 30% of their time. If I had a dollar for every time I heard that, um, I would be able to buy you all a lovely, um, vehicle or a house or something. It's all the time uh, do I hear people propose this as a way to test things out. It simply doesn't work uh, because the 30% that you're supposed to be spending testing out Agile quickly becomes 15%, 5%, 0%. And then Agile begins to appear to not work because nobody's actually using it the way that it was designed. People in an Agile environment are meant to be on one team. They have one backlog. They go to one daily stand-up, right? We want to establish teams that are persistent and permanent as much as we can make them. This is what's going to allow us to have actual high-performing groups that come up with amazing innovative ideas and solutions because they get to stay together and they become experts on a particular region or persona or business unit, right? These are, these are valuable customer-centric ways to organize ourselves so that when we have a new project that's coming down, we don't grab a bunch of disparate individuals and turn them into some sort of ad hoc collection of people and call them a team and expect them to come together magically and work on a project together. Instead, we keep these people together, and when new work, new projects materialize and get approved, we send them to a particular team. And these teams work on lots of different projects at the same time. Nobody's saying you need a permanent team for every project, but this team that we're sending this new project to in the diagram that you see might already have three things in progress, or five things in progress, or 12 things in progress, depending on the size and complexity of the work that they're doing, but instead of, of grabbing individuals and trying to force them into a team, we keep people together. And this is really critical for long-term high performance of, of a group of people in a really actual team setting. And so over time, we would want to build up multiples of these cross-functional teams from a larger marketing department, right? So you can see the, the diagram here is showing you each color would represent a different function in a marketing organization. And then we pull them together to make a persistent cross-functional team. And you can see that they're not carbon copies of each other, right? There's different concentrations of specialties on these different teams, and that's going to depend on the type of work that they do. Right? If we've got a team that is focused on the top of the funnel or demand generation, they might need more content creators than a team that is looking to focus on retention and upselling folks at that end of the customer journey. So the teams don't have to be 
mirror images of each other, but we do want them to have the skills necessary to execute their projects from start to finish whenever possible. Another way to look at this is that we've got these teams one, two, three, four that are pulled together right, to support a particular product or a persona. In the Spotify model, this would be called a tribe, but we can see here that they are pulled together permanently in these discrete teams. And in order to support people with particular functional specialties, we can use this idea of a chapter that you see here as a content chapter. All the people in that chapter are content marketers, and they can get together in chapter meetings once a week or so to talk about their own functional needs. They might have a chapter lead that used to be their functional manager, right? So we're not losing some of these more traditional reporting structures. We're not losing a way for people to support one another in their execution of their own job roles. We're just bringing people together in a different way. Here you see they are organized based on um, parts of the funnel, right, or stages of the customer journey. So we're bringing people together so they can become these specialists in a certain aspect of the journey and deliver something amazing to our customers as they are going through this stage of the journey. And then we would have some sort of uh, senior leader that's overseeing all of this to make sure there's strong connections between teams so that there's a consistent experience across the entire journey there. Last view of this, uh, this is how we visualize the larger Agile marketing organization at Agile Sherpas when we work with clients. So you can see these execution teams. These are those persistent Agile units that are ideally organized around the customer are these outer light blue cogs. And then we've got a strategy group here that's in the middle between the leaderships or the executives and the doers of the work making a translation, right? The leadership team is going to set large strategic goals and priorities, and then the strategy groups are going to translate those for their particular region or product or business unit so that the people doing the work understand exactly how their day-to-day -day tasks connect to the larger priorities of the group. And so each of those light blue cogs would have their own backlog, would have their own visualized workflow, and the teal cogs in the middle are helping them to create those with input from leadership. So we're, we're flattening things out here, but we're also making sure there's a strong connection between strategic priorities and the daily activities that people engage in. All right. So we've talked through lots of stuff here that you can do to start making Agile actually happen for you, some watch outs that I want to um, put in your head as you go forward. Keep in mind that you've got projects plus business as usual or BAU work plus the stuff you have no idea is coming your way. That can make for a messy backlog. So it's ideal for you to have somebody who owns it, right? One person whose job it is to make sure that backlog is up to date and prioritized the right way. If you serve multiple stakeholders, it's important to get them aligned as early as possible because otherwise you're going to end up with lots of number one priorities in your backlog, which is a recipe for conflict and uncertainty. You may be uh, looking at a cult of multitasking in your organization. Right? It's, it's quite common for people to feel that if they're busy, they're important, and that can lead them to take on too much and for things to get delayed, so you may um, struggle with WIP application, work in progress limit application, uh, if you are traditionally a multitasking style of organization. You want to make sure people feel ownership over your visualized workflow, over your Kanban board. So everybody should feel comfortable getting in there and updating what they're doing so that it's always accurate and it doesn't get stale. You also want to make sure that your new lovely Agile meetings don't get just added in on top of everything else, that they also replace something. Otherwise, people quickly become resentful of these new Agile meetings we're asking them to go to. So checklist for you here. Build your backlog and ruthlessly prioritize it. Right? Make sure that we've got one, two, three, four stack-ranked priorities. We have no side-by-side -side priorities. 
reflect the work you're doing on a digital Kanban board of some kind. Get some width limits in place. You can start with personal ones as an easy option. Get your stand-ups going and schedule retros, retrospectives on a regular cadence. And then think about a way to begin piloting on a really truly dedicated Agile team that's all Agile all the time. And think about what scaling might look like, right? Which team might go first, second, third? When's it time to flip the switch and take everybody Agile? If you want to go a little further here, um, you're seeing a URL for a free course uh, that we offer at Agile Sherpas. It used to be $79, and then this pandemic thing happened, and we thought that everybody needs a little more agility in their life, so we've opened it up to be free. Um, you're welcome to go and check that out for a more detailed dive into a lot of the stuff that I've been talking to you about today. Tom, I'll turn it over to you for uh, next bit. Thank you. Yeah, this is very, very interesting, and I definitely, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll find it very useful for our own organization. Um, so before we dive into questions, I'd like to quickly introduce you to Arm Treasure Data. So for close to a decade, Arm Treasure Data has been helping brands solve complex data problems as one of the earliest customer data platforms, or CDPs. We continue to grow and have uh, more than 400 global customers across many industries from automotive to CPG to retail to financial services. And our enterprise customer data platform empowers brands with rich, rich customer insights that drive outstanding customer experiences. With advanced data management capabilities at the core, we enable brands to identify, engage, and acquire customers efficient, efficiently, all within a flexible, scalable, and secure environment. So. Um, now is a good time to ask questions, so I'll transition over to that. And uh, let's start with a question that I have, Andrea. So we talked a lot about um, extend. Uh, we talked a lot about you know visualization, visualizing the work, and how would you suggest? Uh, are there any specific tools you suggest, or how would you just suggest people find tools to be able to visualize their backlog? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm a fan of simplicity early on. Um, Trello is one of my go-to recommendations just because it's quite intuitive and easy to get started. There's a lot of tools out there that are trying to cater to Agile marketers more and more. Um, we've started using it, Agile Sherpa is experimenting with Monday.com, and I've been enjoying that. Um, those are both pretty straightforward options um, that are easy to do. I would say the most important thing is to think carefully about what you actually need and to let your process drive the purchase of a tool as opposed to buying a tool right away and then trying to fit your process into it. Okay, great. Thank you. And another question is, are there certain kinds of marketing work that Agile goes really well with or maybe some where it doesn't work as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, honestly, Every type of work can fit into an Agile system. It's more a matter of tailoring the system to fit the type of work. So a creative services team, for instance, or internal communications, these types of folks get lots of incoming requests, and they need a more continuous flow style system, something that looks more like Kanban, whereas if you're aligning with product development or doing project-based work, then sprints and something more like Scrum is going to be more appropriate. Um, but again, thinking through what's going to work, what type of people do you have, is going to help you design the right type of process. Okay. And if you have a small team,